Welcome to this month's edition of Connections. We find ourselves here in the month of March, and during this month of March, we celebrate National Women's History Month. The specific theme for the year 2023 is celebrating women who tell our stories. And as we begin, we always begin by a meditation, a reflection. I think it is most appropriate this evening as we move into this National Women's History Month that we all become a little familiar with the first woman of Kanewa, the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is in every country and in every culture where we work. Tonight, I'm joined and very grateful to Olivia Paust from our communications department who will be with us this evening. And after I do my report to you, then we'll be able to listen to Olivia in terms of the work that she is now doing here at Kanewa. She joined Kanewa in July, following her graduation from Lemoyne College in Syracuse, where she majored in English and in communications. We are truly delighted that she joins us and we'll be able to talk a little bit more with, with Olivia um, later on in the program, but for now, so that we can begin by just listening first to God's word before ours. I would like Olivia to read to us, and share with us the passage that we are all familiar with of the Annunciation scene in the Gospel of St. Luke. Olivia, thank you for joining us, and would you please lead us in the meditation? Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of, Gal of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Olivia, thank you very much. We're all so familiar with that story. Next week, we celebrate the Feast of the Annunciation. We will hear that gospel story again, how powerful that was, and particularly during this National Women's History Month, as we look to the first woman of Kanewa, the Blessed Mother, and we reflect there on how she, in one very real sense, begins the story of women who tell our stories. Um, the Blessed Mother's role is found in the entire world in which Kanewa works, in all the cultures where we are present, she is recognized as one who tells a very powerful story. And the story certainly is one that I think that we can connect to because how often is it that we find ourselves maybe overwhelmed by circumstances, not knowing how we're going to be able to accomplish something. And yet from the story here that we hear, from the story that the Blessed Mother tells, it is very simply a matter of recognizing that with God, nothing is impossible. And if we are called to do something by God, he will give us the power, the grace to enable us to do it. And the Blessed Mother responded to that with her very simple words, recognizing that it was to be his will and his word that was to be accomplished in her. And with that moment, God became flesh in the womb of Mary. That's the theological basis. That's the spiritual context for the work that we do as we seek to continue to tell the story of how God gives hope when he is carried by us, by so many of the women who work in Kanewa, and Olivia will share some of those stories with us later, and by the ways in which we continue to work to bring the presence, the healing presence, the merciful presence of God into our world. But before we turn to that, let me just update you since the last time that we were together in this first part of the connections that we are accustomed to, to using now to follow. 
So since last month, you will recall last month in the month of February, I shared with you the basic funding process for Kanewa, how important that is for us to recognize that Kanewa, and it's at this time of year that the different regional directors go about the work of identifying projects. And those the projects are evaluated, they're assessed. We try then to work them into our budget for the year 2024. So that budget becomes very important and accomplishing the budget, making these plans a reality is only thanks to you. It is your generosity, your being informed as per the mission of Kanewa, your prayer that makes it possible for us to put together our budgets. And on behalf of the entire Kanewa family, I thank you. The second area, of course, that I talked about last month with regard to the funding for Kanewa is what we have in the emergency campaigns. I made reference to several of those emergency campaigns uh, last month. There was the campaign a number of years ago with the ISIS invasion. There was the campaign that came about as a result of the pandemic. There was the campaign that came about with the explosion of the port in Beirut. It was the campaign that came about and is still ongoing with regard to the invasion of Russia into the state of Ukraine. That remains and continues to be a concern for us. To date, Kanewa has given in the area of $6 million to help the Ukrainian people within Ukraine and the Ukrainian people who fled Ukraine into the neighboring countries, the Ukrainian refugees. Kanewa, meaning you thanks to your interest, to your being informed, to your prayerful discernment as to what God was asking you to give to help those in need, to be some source, some, not a source, to be a glimpse of hope, bringing them to the source of hope, who is the crucified and risen Jesus. These people in Ukraine, in Ukraine and in the neighboring countries have received your assistance, your prayers and your financial support. Thank you. Last month, I traveled with the Director of Communications, Michael LaSavita, to Chicago. We went there to give support, and the image that you're looking at is the table sponsored by Kanewa along with the Lumen Christi Institute. Our attempts there were to give support to the Lumen Christi Institute in its efforts to organize a day and an evening around support for Kanewa. At the luncheon, we were able to listen to His Excellency, Archbishop Boris Gudziak. Archbishop Gudziak, as you know, and I've mentioned him here before, Archbishop Gudziak is the arch eparch for the arch eparchy of Philadelphia here in the United States. He has been a leader throughout the United States and throughout the world in trying to bring attention to the need for people to come to the support in prayer, in prayerful solidarity, and through financial means of the people who are suffering in Ukraine because of the invasion that was initiated by Russia in February of 2022. And so we continue to give support. I continue to thank you for your attentiveness to these efforts that we make. It was an initiative that is something that Ukraine, ha that Kanewa has had from the very first days, the hours after the Russian invasion. And Cardinal Dolan, our chair, the chair of the Board of Trustees has been very much a leader not only for Kanewa, but throughout the United States and in the world in trying to bring attention uh, to the needs of the Ukrainian people and their suffering. Second area of concern that I mentioned last time was of course with the earthquake assistance. You all are familiar with the earthquake that devastated parts of Turkey and Syria, including some of the most ancient parts of Turkey. I made reference last month, recall these, this, that particular text in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, it's there where the followers were first called Christians. That area has been devastated. Now a Turkish city, it has been devastated by, by the earthquake. Kanewa remains present thanks to our office in Beirut and the work that is being done in our office in Beirut, in particular for the people of Syria, where which comes under the jurisdiction, if you will, of the office in Beirut, where we continue to give them support. I mentioned last month, the support, which is medicine, clean water, right now, especially food, shelter, warm clothing. These are the kinds of things that right now, thanks to the work that is being done by our office uh, in Beirut, we're able to bring assistance to the people in Syria. But again, 
the office that is working in Syria out of Beirut, our office from Beirut working in Syria is able to do the great things they're doing thanks to you. You are making possible what we're doing. One statistic that I think is worthy of me sharing with you now, and that is, as I read, as I do, each month, it's my responsibility to, to track with the CFO the budget and to track with her and the others on our staff how we're doing with regard to the emergency campaigns. In the month of February alone, thanks to you, thanks to your generosity, uh, we collected $693,000 for the month of February. That money which has been dispersed through the office in Beirut to the people who are suffering as victims of the earthquake. Again, I thank you. I think it is something that is quite a tribute to your generosity, to your goodness. We try to be the vehicles that pass on the great work that you are doing. I also want to make one final reference in terms of just bringing you up to date with regard to events since our being together last month in the month of February. And that was just last week. Last week on Thursday, on March 9th, I received the invitation from the Legatus group to go out to Long Island and there can celebrate and preach at a mass of the Legatus chapter, the Long Island Legatus chapter, and then to speak at their business meeting and dinner so as to be able to share with the Legatus group the mission of Kinewa. For those of you who may not be that familiar with Legatus, Legatus is an international organization of Catholic lay men and lay women. These people, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, business owners with their spouses are dedicated men and women. They're dedicated first to the Catholic faith. They're dedicated to their family and they're dedicated to excellence in their professional lives. They, are the, they want to be involved and they want to be involved more and more in those causes where there is human suffering. And so I welcomed the opportunity to be able to go to the Long Island chapter of Legatus to share with them the mission of Kinewa. I take this moment to pause before we move on and listen to Olivia. I take this moment though to pause just to invite you, if you are familiar with groups, be they school groups, whether it be at the level of a high school, the university, or other groups who might be interested in hearing something more about Kinewa, to please let me know. Let me know where the groups are and how we might get in touch with them so that we would be able to travel to those groups, share with them the story, and ask them to be informed, to pray with us, and to be as generous as you are in supporting the mission of Kinewa. And so I thank you. I thank you for that. Now, let me just turn. We have a very special guest here, as you know, from time to time. I tried to bring in the Kinewa team. You met some of them uh, back in June in Jerusalem. You met some others in Bethlehem Manger Square in December. You met Thomas Varghese, our director of programs, a couple of months ago. Now, as I mentioned before, I welcome Olivia Paust. Olivia's presence here is very important to us as being part of the communications team. She is very much focused in working on our award-winning magazine, One, as well as constantly feeding the Kineba blog. So I invite you, please, to go to the website, go to the blog, and in particular in this month, you'll be able to see the great work that Olivia is doing specifically regarding the work and the heroic witness given by the women, religious and lay women who are involved throughout the Kinewa world in giving witness to Kinewa's work. Olivia, again, thank you so much for being here. And I think we'd all like to listen to the great work that you're doing. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here, especially for Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. um, gender equality is an issue that's always been kind of up on my list. So being at Kinewa, I've really gotten to have the chance to not only write about it, but to see the wonderful work that Kinewa's partners are doing, um, but also to hear from the beneficiaries themselves in one magazine and on the blog of some of their experiences. Um, so Kinewa has long shared stories of women in one magazine, whether it's in our recent edition from December or from decades prior. So for Women's History Month, one of the initiatives that we started on International Women's Day, which was last Wednesday, March 8th, was pulling stories from the one archive that highlight the voices of women in Kinewa's world. So this includes lay women, women religious, and the beneficiaries themselves um, and the programs that support them. It's 
important to note that while it's crucial to support women and to include women, what's really impactful in making a lasting, meaningful change is the empowerment of women, uplifting their voices, creating intentional spaces and communities for women and girls, and acknowledging the contributions of women in all communities. So with that, the first of the stories that we shared on our blog was a letter from Georgia that ran in the summer 2020 edition of One, which highlighted Anahit McCoyan, who is the director of Caritas Georgia. And it's important to note the time in summer 2020, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic and when it was beginning to get worse. And most people were afraid for good reason to leave their own houses, but much less their country. And Anna, he left her family in Armenia to go and to spend time with some of the beneficiaries of uh, Caritas George's work. So in this letter, she speaks of visiting some of the children and the elderly who Caritas serves, as well as um, just expressing her gratitude for these people and for what they've endured. So I think that a quote that she actually writes in that letter is uh, pretty good at summing up her compassion, love, and dedication. And she wrote, the charism of Car Caritas is the belief that every human being is of value and that we have to serve them unconditionally. Now is the moment when times are uncertain and fear grips our hearts that we serve the poorest of the poor, trusting in the mercy and love of God. So as we mentioned, this is available on our blog. You can access the excerpt that we've pulled, but also if you go to the blog, you'll see the full story it links to it. So you can visit it there or on our social media on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And that was posted on March 8th. The next story that we posted after was from autumn 2020 and was based in Israel. The story is called Crafting a New Life and is about the Kushanate Collective, which was co-founded and co-directed by two women, Sister Azizet Kadane and Dr. Didi Maimon Khan. And the collective seeks to serve asylum-seeking women who are in Israel, primarily from Eritrea and some other African countries like Sudan, um, many of whom unfortunately were victims of trafficking, torture, and other horrific crimes. Uh, but the collective offers them psychosocial support in addition to the ability to create an income for themselves through basket weaving and um, other processes like that. And when I mentioned before that the empowerment of women is so important, this is a really good example of that because you have two women leading this initiative and it is establishing a community. It is providing the care that they need to heal and to um, respond to the trauma that they endured, but it is also giving them the option to be self-sufficient and to have a source of income on their own. The most recent story was posted today um, and that is pulled from March 2020s edition of one. It's called Go and Do Likewise is the original story. And it focuses on a school in India that serves children with special needs. But for the excerpt we pulled, we focused on Sister Pushpam Francis Akara, who is the school's principal. And the school serves students ages three to 40. So the scope of its work is <laughs> very impressive. Um, and it goes beyond traditional education and includes music and dance gardening, flower arrangement, candle making, skills that will really click for every student. So it goes beyond what is traditional classroom material that might not work for people with certain disabilities. And you can keep your eye out for more stories every Monday and Wednesday on our blog. They'll be posted on social media as well. Um, one of such stories is on Kadane Maharit Girls Hostel in Meki, Ethiopia. This is our most recent and ran in the December 2022 edition of One. These girls, many of them are victims of kidnapping for forced marriages, of sexual violence and of other abuse. So they're given an education, a community and a place where they truly feel safe. Um, keep your eye out as well for the next issue of One. It's our March, 2023 edition and that should be getting to people's mailboxes soon. So stay tuned for that and also look for it online as well. Olivia, thank you so much uh, for the work that you are doing. Um, we are truly blessed to have you here as part of the Kaneva team. And I can share with everyone here, not only do we have the blessing of her many, many talents uh, in terms of her own capacities for writing and telling the story, but also her connections, because you will see the way in which she connects with so many of the other people that she wants to tell the story about. 
or that she invites to tell the story, as you've done in some of these recent blog posts. So there is that capacity whereby Olivia has the reach so as to bring the story to you from the people who are living the experience on the ground. How powerful is that in terms of what you're doing? And I really am very grateful for that. Along those lines, I'll just share very briefly um, a story that I learned about last weekend. Uh, this came from one of our regional directors, and he shared the story about religious women uh, who were working in a particular clinic. And with the work in their clinic, which had been a um, very much a very, a very challenging work that they had been doing, they're doing an outstanding job at it. But uh, it was around midnight on the 21st of January uh, that they were attacked. The place where they live was attacked. The armed people who came into the place where they live and who attacked them in this particular place, dragged them out, forced them to travel with them through the night. They walked from Saturday night until Sunday evening, being forced to move from one place to another as these individuals tried to um, bring about some very serious in grave injustices against the women and against the townspeople that they were trying to help. Permit me just to read to you um, a brief quote from one of the sisters in terms of what her experience was. I quote, on the way, this is the journey that these forced um, individual, that these individuals forced her to take. On the way, many times I fell down. Thorns pierced my soft sandal shoes to my feet. For some time, they left me with one man and then others came. They tried, made attempts to kill her. She prepared herself for death and Mother Mary came to my help. She saved me from that man. And in the morning, they gave her her cell phone, her cell phone which she was able eventually to use in reconnecting with her own village people. And the, she credits the village people, the finances, and the prayers of her local town people as being the way in which they were able to eventually inform or inform the police about what had happened. And as a result of that, we were able to save both the heroic sister and another member of her community. Of course, this story was shared with me last weekend. I've been in communication with that regional director. Our primary concern was for the safety of the sisters, moving the work from one clinic place to another to assure their safety and all that now goes on in terms of what is necessary when someone has gone through such an experience of violence and trauma um, that Kanae were here, again, thanks to you. And I ask you for your prayers for this particular location, this particular area, as we continue to try to support them. And I think Olivia brought that out very beautifully in the way in which she talked about the range of experiences that the heroic women, religious and lay, who are involved in the life and in the work of Kanewa are about. And I think that is something that is very important. And you, your stories are really what your stories, your prayer, your being informed, and your coming to assist us is extremely important with regard to the work that Kanewa is doing. And so I thank you. And Olivia, I guess I could just ask you, I mean, is there any activity that Kanewa is involved in that we do not identify women in leadership roles and leading with heroic, heroic example, whether they be religious sisters or lay women in all the world that Kanewa works? I don't think I can think of any for that now. <laughs> well, and you've done the research. And so yeah. I think we're very fortunate to have Olivia here as she pursues that and pursues other opportunities here in the city where you can also, you are become a voice with regard to sharing with other institutions. I don't know if you wanted to mention any where you have been a voice where people can come and ask you, what is Kanewa doing on behalf of women? Sure. Well, going to the various Kanewa events has provided that opportunity, but also our connection to the United Nations. Right. It's currently the uh, Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, it's the 67th session, it's currently ongoing. It began last week, mm -hmm. uh, the time it to kind of line up with International Women's Day. And I was able to attend a session last night. So I was able to speak with women from a variety of NGOs and organizations whose work also, it, it's pretty, it's global. So Thank you. <laughs> it was great to hear from them and to share Kanewa's experiences as well. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Um, and you think you can all see how fortunate, how blessed uh, Kanewa is to have Olivia here working with us and being such an articulate um, person with regard to her writing and her contact with, with the world outside of here, as well as the people who are making inquiries with regard to Kanewa here in New York City. So by way really of um, closing it up for tonight, I just want to invite all of us again to continue to move into this Lenten journey that we're about. 
intensify our prayer, perhaps connect fasting to almsgiving, uh, challenge myself. If I'm able to reduce uh, in terms of what I eat or beverages that I drink and direct that money to almsgiving, maybe that almsgiving can be given over to Kanewa in terms of any of the budget items or any of the emergency campaigns that we're currently running. Also, I ask you tonight and during this week, during this week, we are celebrating um, the 10th anniversary of the election of Pope Francis to the See of Peter. And so I would ask you to please keep Pope Francis in your prayers. Keep him in your prayers um, during the time that you have reflect upon his own ministry this time. I also thank you for your support. I remind you of the two upcoming fundraising events that we have on May 18th, when we will be having it together at the Plan Dome Country Club. Um, that's going to be a great outing. So come and join us if you play golf. Take some level of sponsorship if you'd like to do that just to help us out. Or send a donation if you don't play golf or you can't make that date. But the date is May 18th. is going to be Kanewa's inaugural golf classic. And as I said before on this show, and I've already received a response, if you live in some other part of the country and think that we could come and start a golf outing there, let me know. And then please, as a save the date, I would ask you to go to December 5th on your calendar. On December 5th, you will see the second annual Kanewa Gala Dinner. For those of you who were able to be with us at the first one, last December 13th in a private club in Manhattan, I think you saw how great an experience that was. And the one that we're going to be doing on December 5th will be in another private club, and it also will be great experience. I ask you to take that under consideration. I see there is a question, so if I can take one question, me or maybe Olivia. Yes, this question comes from CAPAC2. What women empowerment projects does Kanewa fund in Ethiopia? Well, Kanewa is involved with our regional director and the team that we have there in Ethiopia uh, in empowering women on several different levels, whether it's in terms of healthcare clinics or in terms of education or in terms of the work that is done, particularly with one of the, I think, um, slides, one of the images that you saw tonight, where the religious women there are helping people who have different disabilities. And Kanewa, and again, thanks to your generosity, we're able to try to bring people to get more involved in that and to also provide financial support so that they can be trained in that. One of the areas that Olivia mentioned that Kanewa has been involved in and will be getting more involved in is the whole area of giving protection and assistance to victims of human trafficking. Which brings me to one of my last points that I have to make this evening, uh, namely the next time that we will be getting together here, the next time that we'll be getting together here for connections, hopefully will be uh, sometime in that week of April 19th or 20th. Uh, I'm not sure the exact date yet. The reason for that is that it is precisely in that week where I will be at a meeting in Cyprus uh, to have an overall assessment from the part of all the aid agencies that work with the Oriental churches as to where things are now with regard to the work that's being done by the aid agencies in the Middle East. But from there, on the island of Cyprus, I have been asked to visit a camp, a camp where um, we, try, we, we, we may try to support, again, victims of human trafficking. Uh, this particular camp here is one that brings in, uh, unfortunately, the many victims, and one is too many, but the many victims of human trafficking that are brought to this camp from different parts of the Mediterranean. So I've been asked to go there. If it's possible for us to do the um, the program from that location, uh, I will certainly do it. I'm talking about that, however, right now with the great production team that we have. And that really leads me to my final note tonight. One, to thank you, Olivia, for being here and enlightening all of us uh, with your leadership role here and with the way in which you are allowing for us to really celebrate by celebrating the women who tell our stories. But also I'd like to be able to thank um, Tim McCarthy, in terms of our super producer who works all week to make sure that these are ready to go when we come together here. And Nelson Salcedo, uh, who is always here and working with all of the instruments comes out of his tremendous background that he has. And someday you're going to have to see the whiteboard that he uses to help us and keep us on track. And of course, with Nick Lopez. Uh, Nick Lopez in Nick, we're very fortunate to really have a professional that's behind all the, the action that goes on here and keeps the very best, um, the very best 
of what we're trying to bring out in front of you. And I thank you for your patience in being with us and look forward to seeing you again in three weeks, uh, excuse me, on the third week of April, either from Rome or from Cyprus. Thank you.